thanks for coming. So I, I, I like Intimate Group. Yeah, thank, and thank you, Bob, for coming, and thank you all. Um, you know, I say I, I'm, uh, I pride myself of not uh, being a person with feelings, but your movie. You pride yourself yes, not of having feelings? Of not having feelings. <laughs> Are you an alien? <laughs> <laughs> but you prove me wrong. Every time I watch this movie, you make me cry, so. Oh, good. I, I like making women cry. <laughs> Next to making women cry, it's my second thing. Yeah, yeah. So before, before we start, let me just, uh, for the record, give you, uh, introduce you officially to uh, Bob's work and, and bio. Uh, Bob White is- I'm gonna take a short nap here. <laughs> <laughs> Bob White is an Oscar nominated and Emmy winning filmmaker whose documentaries have covered the Marx Brothers, W.C. Fields, Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, Woody Allen, and Kurt Vonnegut. And as you know, he's also a screenwriter, producer, and director of TV series and feature films. In 1996, uh, Whitey wrote and produced the feature film, The Mother Night, uh, the, I'm sorry, Mother Night, based on the Kurt Vonnegut novel. In 1999, he produced and directed the HBO comedy special, Larry David, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which served as the springboard for the Golden Globe winning series, Curb Your Enthusiasm, for which Whitey served as principal director and executive producer for the first five seasons. In 2008, Whitey made his direct directorial debut with the feature, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People, which I saw this last weekend and I really enjoyed it. You were the one I saw. Yeah. <laughs> three, three cents came in online and I didn't know. That was me. That was you, okay. And my family. In 2011, Whitey returned to his documentary roots with his acclaimed film, Woody Allen, a documentary, which earned Whitey two more Emmy nominations. In 2014, Whitey created, wrote, and directed the British television comedy series, Mr. Sloan, and also in that year released his feature film, The Giver, co-written by Whitey and adapted from the Newbery Award-winning novel by Louis Laurie. The film starred Jeff Bridges and Meryl Streep. Carbonegat and Stuck in Time, an authorized documentary on the author, which Whitey commenced filming in 1988, was released last year with the letter written in 1982, the yeah, letter written yeah. to Vonnegut. So just to start, I have a funny- I'm sorry we're out of time, but it was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to make it, make it as uh, short as possible. Uh, I'm gonna try to start with a funny and a serious question. I, I want, can I address, I wanna ask a question of the audience. Yes. Two, two things. First of all, how, how many of you had read Vonnegut or familiar with any of his books? Before today, okay, so that was probably a big part of your showing up. And then, how, how many of you are under the impression that I have anything to do with those memes with my name on them? Directed well, that by was Robert my Lewis. first question. Oh. Wait, because <laughs> I'd hate to think you were suckered in here thinking, oh, the Just meme wondering. guy, because I have nothing to do with them. Let's get, let's say that right up front. So, that so was... if you're waiting for us to screen some of those <laughs> videos, you're in the wrong place. That was my first question. Okay. With such solid body of work. Yeah. Is it? Do you find it funny or sad that your legacy is going to be the meme? <laughs> um, it's it's amusing to me. It's I, I don't find it um, especially irritating or gratifying. But it, it it has something happened this week where I thought, okay, this, this is really getting out of control. Um, a brief story about how all that happened. If, if you're if you, if you know that my series Curb Your Enthusiasm, which we saw some clips from in the movie, you know that I directed most of those shows for the first five years, so at the end of the, the episode, something would happen where things would just kind of go very badly and sort of explode in Larry David's face, and then this music would come on and directed by Robert B. Whitey. So because the final moments of the show were always about something kind of disastrous happening, um, people started to take videos where something terrible happened, or I mean, just it could be somebody skateboarding and falling on their face or whatever, and they put the music in, in my name, <laughs> directed by Robert B. Whitey. So, you know, I had a Facebook page that somebody set up for me. I, I don't really manage it. Uh, and, you know, I had like 200 followers, a very modest following, half of them people that I knew, the other half just fans of the show or whatever. And then I started, to, to, to grow like exponentially. And then I was getting like 
200 in a day, and then a thousand. What is going on here? And it was sort of the birth of those memes, and, and um, they were becoming very popular all the world over. It was crazy. And um, uh, so then people were going on Facebook to find Robert B. White and signing up on my, you know, following my Facebook page. So I went on and said, no, I have nothing to do with those memes. But it just, it got out of control. And then, um, then I just said, oh, what the hell? And, you know, t-shirts were being made and bumper stickers and all this. People were getting it tattooed on their bodies. <laughs> People have them directed by Robert B. Whitey tattooed on their bodies. And so, um, in any event, so then I, I, I bought a t-shirt. My wife actually bought a t-shirt. I said to my wife, I, I showed her this ad for these directed by Robert B. Whitey t-shirts to show her how silly this all was. And then she ordered two. <laughs> and um, one for me, one for her. So I put on a, a t-shirt, and so my editor actually on this film took a picture of me wearing the t-shirt, and I put it on the Facebook page, saying, I have nothing to do with these memes, and I, I don't imagine this photo is going to help. And then the photo got viewed by like three and a half million people. It was crazy. So anyway, but, but, and people send me pictures of like people in, in you know, Kazakhstan, who have you know face masks during the pandemic, directed by Robert B. Whitey over the thing, and then um, anyway. So here's what happened recently: is that in Ukraine, people are taking people are taking videos of like Russian tanks exploding and you know these terrible humiliations for the Russians. I mean, I don't consider them terrible. I think good, let them be humiliated. But um, uh, they take these things where something goes bad, for, and then. They, they put the, the, the music in my name at the end, directed by Robert B. Whitey. So I'm a huge hero in Ukraine now, because people <laughs> think I'm making these videos, which I'm not. So, You're defeating the Russians. Yeah, I'm defeating the Russians <laughs> single-handedly. Yeah. Um, so on MSNBC the other night, uh, what's her name, I think Nicole Williams, is that it? Noelle Williams, uh, was interviewing um, Igor Novits Novitsky, I think his name is, was a former advisor to the president of Ukraine. Um, uh, why am I blanking out his name now? Uh, Zelensky, thank you. And he was talking about this is during the drone strikes, like the kamikaze drone strikes in, in Ukraine. And during the interview, he's wearing a t shirt that says directed by Robert B. White. <laughs> so people, are, you know, friends of mine are sending me, did you see this? Novitsky is wearing a shirt with your name. And then next thing I know, uh, somebody comments in Novisky is on Twitter, and he comments about it. It's, a, it's an honor to wear the name. And then I came on and I made a comment to him. So I get an email the other day from some government agency in the Ukraine asking me to join this group to, uh, to sort of help aid the Ukrainians in the war. And one of the things involved is like a Zoom conference with uh, Zelensky. I've been invited to Zoom with Zelensky to strategize about like a media uh, presentation about the war. And it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna Zoom with Zelensky to talk about what I can do for. I'm just a silly Jewish filmmaker living in Studio City. I don't, you should have you know, sent Larry David. Yeah, that would that, <laughs> put it that would right away. So it's it's really crazy, but any of it. Um, so funny or sad? It is part of my legacy. Uh, it's, it's, it's amusing, but uh, it's, you know, it has nothing to do with me. I wish there was a way for me to monetize it. You know, <laughs> that, <laughs> that would make it make some money off it. That would make it fun. <laughs> but anyway, okay. so, uh, yeah, it's, if you, if you, I don't know about now, but up to very recently, I'm not suggesting you do this now, but when we leave, is you could get you could get on your phone and just Google the words directed by. And then you know how like uh, predictive text comes up. The number one answer that will come up is Robert B. Whitey. Not Steven Spielberg or Quentin Tarantino, but me. <laughs> so it's okay. That's okay. okay. So now the yes, the more serious question. Yes. Something that I love about this movie is that it's not just a biography of Barnegat, it's also the story of your friendship. Mm -hmm. And you really poured everything uh, into this movie. It's also kind of like a letter, a love letter to Barnegat sure. from you. Sure. And um, 
I don't know. This this may not be even a question, but um, what what can you tell us about Vonnegut that uh, even those who have read him don't don't know about him? Well, you you get a sense of him from the film. Hopefully, I mean, my my, my feeling is that I sort of want audiences at the end of this film to feel like they've just spent two hours with this guy and kind of got to know him a bit. You get a sense of what it's like to spend time with him. He's just a very affable, lovely guy. And like all humans, he, you know, he had ups and downs. I mean, he could be a little bit, I wouldn't say manic, but you know, he was prone to depression sometimes. Uh, I remember one night being in New York uh, and there was a, a jazz guitarist I was gonna go listen to and I, I knew that he, like this guy, and I said, hey, why don't you come and, and join me? And he just, you know, I don't think so, pal. I said, oh, what? You, sound, uh, you sound down. He said, yeah. And, you know, again, that second marriage went very bad. Uh, a lot of his depression was due to that. He was in kind of this loveless marriage, and there were fights and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, that happens with anybody. For the most part, he was a very up guy. I mean, I just had to do that laughing montage under the credits because that, that's what I mostly remember about him were the laughs. We had a lot of laughs together. And as I say in the film, he was sort of the anti-Solinger, whereas, you know, Solinger and some artists really kind of seal themselves away, don't want anything to do with their readers and their fans. Um, I mean, that would be the most severe version of that. Vonnegut was the opposite. He loved getting letters from fans, often replied to them with a, you know, a, a personal hand-typed letter, and not just, oh, thank you for your card, but he would really respond to what they said. And the same thing on the street when people, and I used to say this in the film, people would come up to him on the street. Oh, Mr. Vonnegut, I don't want to disturb you, but I just want you to know I love your books and I'm your biggest fan and I'll let you go. And then, oh, what's your name? My name's Tony. Oh, Tony, where do you live in New York? Or are you visiting? Oh no, I'm I'm, I'm visiting, but I'll, I'll let you. Go. Oh, where are you from? And he would engage them in conversation, and, and um, so they would leave having a story to tell about their conversation with Kurt Vonnegut. He was that kind of a guy. He was um, very much a part of his roots. Um, you know, just a friendly Hoosier from uh, Indianapolis who never really lost that kind of. Uh, almost country boy attitude. You know? mm -hmm. So it was really lovely that he was as world famous as he was and revered as he was, but he, you know, just full of humanity. And most of these people have read uh, Vonnegut, but for those who haven't read it, read him, um, would you say he's still relevant and why? Yes, he's still very well read. People mostly discover him uh, like in high school, which I did, as we see, um, because he asks questions that young people are interested in about the world and our place in the world and, uh, you know, society and love and hate and war and, and uh, how to behave and what's our purpose here and all that. I'm still interested in these questions, so I still find them fascinating. I, I just never outgrew them. Um, but so every concurrent or, or every every subsequent generation sort of rediscovers him and all of his books from i mean player piano was I think 1952 his last book uh there were a few posthumous releases but his last book well he was alive was man without a country in 2005 and his entire library is still in print it's still available in any good bookstore certainly online and that's very rare for an author especially he's been gone now for whatever 15 years, um, uh, to have all of his books in print. Mm -hmm. And they still sell, and um, you know, his kids benefit from the, you know, the sales. And um, no, he's still read and he's still popular. And I think of all the authors of his generation, I mean, sort of that, world, that Depression era, World War II generation, um, whatever, the Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal and John Updike and and uh, Jerzy Kosinski, uh, William Styron. I think my understanding is that Vonnegut still sells better than any of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, those are all great writers, but you don't hear young people getting excited about a Gore Vidal book or a Norman Mailer book, but Vonnegut just speaks to, 
speaks to young people, and I think it's because he's so accessible and so entertaining and so unintimidating. And even people who don't like to read, if they pick up a Vonnegut book, and they, you know, they go, oh, first of all, it's not too short, because he didn't write long books, you know, these kind of oceanic books, you know. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the, the chapters are short, the sentences are short. Um, you know, the words are easy to understand. You have books like Breakfast of Champions that have those drawings. So it's very unintimidating. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've heard from people who have said, I never liked reading. And then somebody gave me a Vonnegut book when I was 18. And I loved it and read everything that he, he wrote. And um, so, yeah, that's a long-winded answer to your question that he's still popular. He's still well-read. Mm -hmm. All over the world, his books are translated to virtually every language. Now, you are a screenwriter, a producer, and a director, but... Well, thank you. <laughs> in case you and so know. are you. <laughs> thank you. Um, what was your very first project? Well, you see in the film, the first project was the Marx Brothers documentary. I mean, I was, I was 18 years old uh, when I decided to do that. I was 22 years old when it was released on public television. It took me four years. But I was um, a severe Marx Brothers fan. I discovered them in junior high school. I was in eighth grade, and I just fell in love with the Marx Brothers. I just saw one of their movies on TV one night. Oh, God. It became an obsession. And this was before, this was just before home video, VHS and, and all that. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was an effort to see all of their films. I mean, they would come on TV sometimes, you know, late at night. And back then we had, oh God, I just feel so old when I talk about this stuff. We'd get the TV guide every week and I would take a yellow highlighting pen and look for, I look for other movies I like too, but especially Marx Brothers film, films. And, oh, there's um, A Day at the Races. I haven't seen that one yet. And then I would stay up and, and, and watch it. And uh, Again, before even home video recording, mm -hmm. I would have a cassette recorder and I'd hang the microphone or the speaker so I could at least get the soundtrack. And... Um, so I love the March Brothers, and um, when I was 18, I decided I would try. I was taking film courses at a community college in Orange County, Orange Coast College. Don't have to go to a big, fancy, expensive university to study film, you know. Um, so, uh, so I was 18, and I decided I wanted to make a documentary on the March Brothers because none existed, and I wanted to see one. So for me to see one, I had to make it. So I put together a proposal and, and sort of learned the basics of filmmaking and brought other people into the project who knew what they were doing, who had experience, and applied to the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which is the financing arm of public television. And, you know, sent them my pitch, my treatment, and they wanted to do it. So anyway, the short version is that they did it. They financed it. I made it. And I was 22 years old when it went on the air. And... Um, as you see in the film, the, you know, the next film I was going to do was the Vonnegut film. And you see, I wrote him that letter in 1982. I'd like to make a film about you. And if you agree, I'm sure I could have the financing within a year or so. Ha uh ha. -huh. 40, 40 years later. And when was your break? My break? As a director. Well, that was my break. It was a break that I created uh, because it wasn't like anybody came along and gave me you know, just said, hey, we want you to direct. I was 22. I hadn't done anything. I, I, in, fact, I in fact, was a three-time USC film school reject. I applied to the USC cinema department three times. I was rejected each time. I went to USC um, as an undeclared major and took some film courses available to non-majors. They're mainly sort of history, film history courses more than actual production. Although you could still take a camera course, an editing course. So I took what I could there, but I was not accepted into the film school. So no, nobody was gonna come along and give me money. So I just created my own project as, as unlikely as it was for anybody to give six figures in financing to a, at that time a 21 year old kid who had never made a movie before. I said, here, make your movie and we'll put it on national television. But I was passionate and um, energetic and um, desperate. And uh, so I made it. And then once that happened, the next one was easier because now I had a film under my belt. Mm -hmm. I did something for HBO on the history of stand-up comedy. And then I did my, March, my WC Fields film and that won an Emmy. 
And that gave me a little more momentum. And so I was doing these documentaries. Now, uh, somewhere in there, I went to work. I had a development job for a production company called Rollins and Joffe. And one of the things I did was I read scripts that people would send in, you know, writers would send in scripts that they wanted to get made into movies. And a script landed on my desk written by a guy named Larry David. And it was really, really funny. And um, it was called Prognosis Negative. And so I suggested to the guys we should meet with them because, you know, maybe maybe we should, you know, option this and make it. So he came in for this meeting. And Larry's, I guess, 12 years older than I, but we became very good friends just from that day forward. And he was doing stand-up and I would go see him do stand-up so that there'd always be at least one person in the audience laughing because nobody <laughs> thought it was funny except for me and a handful of other people. And um, so we remained friendly for years. And then... Uh, what was, as far as a, kind of a break, what was significant about that was the call I got from him in October of 1998 saying that he was thinking of doing a, a comedy special for HBO, just a one hour comedy special. Uh, that would be about his going back to stand up anyway. And we would shoot it like a documentary, be handheld cameras and he didn't want the script to be written. He wanted to work off of an outline and improvise the dialogue so it would sort of feel more real. Also, Larry's terrible at memorizing dialogue, so that took care of that. Um, and asked me if I wanted to direct it. If, if It was still tentative. It was like, if I make this, would you want to direct it? Because we were friends and we shared a similar sense of humor and we talked about working together. And this was years before Seinfeld that he and I became friends. Uh, and then, of course, he struck it big with Seinfeld and then was looking for his next thing to do. But the idea of Curb was that it was a one-hour special. So yeah, I, I said, yes, yes, of course I want to direct it. So that was my first time actually directing actors, not, you know, just doing a clip show of you know, dead comedians, or living comedians. But um, uh, so that was, that was sort of a break because I got to work with, with actors. And HBO said, well, Bob does documentaries. He's never worked with that. And Larry said, shut up. He'll do it. I want him to do it. And that was that. So, um, and then that led to whatever's followed since. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so that was a break. There, you know, there, there are breaks along the way, but not to sound like one of those um, motivational speakers. Ugh. But I, I, I really do believe you sort of have to create your own opportunities. You don't just sit around waiting for somebody to come up and hand you one. And I'm living proof of that because, again, I was 18 years old. And I said, I want to make a Marx Brothers film. And four years later, I did. Yeah. So. And you made a career of making documentaries of stand-up comedians and, and... Yeah, I mean, that, that, w that was sort of my, my mainstay for a while and something that I, you know, continue to come back to. And of course, this project was an arc over everything, over my feature film, my TV work, Curb, all the other stuff. This was this kind of... Uh, ongoing project that just, mm -hmm. you know. But my question is, uh, the same way Barnegat spent so many years trying to crack the code of Slaughterhouse-5, yeah. you seem to have spent so much time uh, trying to crack the code of laughter, of humor. Mm. Did you crack that code? Well, I'll simplify it. I mean, the, 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 the documentaries that I've done have all been on subjects that I grew up loving. These were all my adolescent obsessions, um, you know, mainly comedian. I mean, my top four when I was a kid were the Marx Brothers, Woody Allen, Lenny Bruce, and Kurt Vonnegut. So when I make these films, it's just, first of all, it's much easier to make a film on a subject you really love and you're really interested in. Because, you know, it's hard work and you're really sort of devoured by the project. And for me, nicer to be dealing with Lenny Bruce clips or Marx Brothers or whatever than, you know, something tragic and, you know, a disease or some uh, whatever. So, so, but I, I, you know, I just love, love these people's work. And, and um, so you just kind of want to share it with the world. So like when I was, again, this is my old man speech again, when I was younger and records were all on vinyl and you actually had to... <laughs> get off your house and get in the car and go to a record store and buy one and bring it back and then put it on the turntable and, you know, lower the needle. And then halfway through, you have to get up off the thing and flip it over. And 
you know, but you, you know, you love the music, so you bought the record and you'd call up your friends and say, oh, come over, I've got the new Rolling Stones album or whatever. And you'd want to share it with them. So, well, isn't that a great guitar riff or isn't that well, it's an interesting lyric or whatever? So that's what I'm doing with, with these films is, isn't Lenny Bruce great? Isn't this a great routine? Isn't this sad what happened to him? And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, uh, isn't this W.C. Fields routine great? Whatever, it's just my way of, the way you invite friends over to listen to a record when, when you were a kid, when I was a kid, is these films are just a way of sort of sharing what I appreciate about these artists with the world. You know? And anyone who wants to tune in can, and if you don't want to, that's fine too. Now I have a short question for you. I see the Marx Brothers, Lenny Bruce, Mort Saul, Woody Allen, Larry David. Do you think only Jews can be funny? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll, 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 uh, no. No, the non-Jews have actually broken into the business a bit. They've got a foothold in it. I, I kind of resent it because it's the one area that you know I think we should really just own. But as it winds up, there are funny non-Jews. There's a few. Um, it's funny, I did a thing at uh, the, the Directors Guild years ago, and I think they, they, they did a thing about a, lo a lot of my work, and I was showing some things. So there's a screening of the Marx Brothers film, and then afterwards there's like a little reception and wine and cheese and all that. And um, so a couple came up to me, and uh, <laughs> this is sort of a reverse way of you know, addressing your question. And it was a German couple, and they said, we saw your film, I have to say, we've never understood why anyone finds funny about the Marx Brothers. Can you, can, you ex <laughs> can you explain what is funny about them? And I said, uh, you're, you're German, right? Yeah, I said, I can't help you. <laughs> and that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> so Germans not known for their sense of humor. They, they make a good car, but, you know, they're not, they're not uh, the funniest people. So leaving, leaving aside the, uh, the Jewish factor, <laughs> how do you think, let's say from W.C. Fields to Larry Fields David? Fields is a non-Jew, there you yeah. go. But from Fields to Larry David, how do you see, from your perspective, that humor evolved, if it did? Mm, boy, you like those academic questions. Oh, you? Let's, I, let's, let's, let's drop it. No, I, mean, drop I, I, I will say this, I will say this. What's interesting about Larry David is that he is not versed in sort of classic film comedy. Uh, whereas I grew up on the Marx Brothers, W.C. Fields, Laurel and Hardy, and The Silence, you know, Chaplin and Keaton, uh, even Harold Lloyd. Uh, you know, I grew up just loving this stuff and devouring it. Once, once I discovered the Marx Brothers, they were like my entry drug into, you know, that whole era. And Larry was, not familiar with any of that stuff. I mean, Larry, Larry told me once that he hadn't even really seen a Marx Brothers film all the way through. He hadn't seen the W.C. Fields film. I mentioned something about Laurel and Hardy's silent films, and he says, oh, I didn't know they made silent films. So that was never his area. His big influence growing up was um, uh, Abbott and Costello, mainly I think the TV show more than the movies, and like Phil Silver's Bilko. This is for Younger people, this all before your time. Um, but, uh, but what's interesting is how you, you, you see what I consider influences, although not l literally influences because he doesn't know their work. But I would be staging a thing, and you know, in, in Curb Your Enthusiasm, if you've seen it, Larry's a very thin guy, and then he has a manager named Jeff who's a very heavy guy. So I would stage scenes and I'd be thinking, well, this is Laurel and Hardy. Mm -hmm. Because Laurel and Hardy always had scenes where they're, they're really intimidated by their wives. Their wives are really tough and they were just, you know, very meek. And, and um, so there are always scenes where they're afraid of the wives. And, you know, Jeff has this wife in the show, Susie, who's, you know, likes to scream and insult. And so there, there'd be scenes where they'd show up at the house and Susie would be at the door and, and Larry would be kind of hiding behind Jeff, you know. And I, and I always had Laurel and Hardy in my mind. And then if, like, Larry was doing battle with a kid, you know. It's like, well, this is pure W.C. Field. Or Larry just generally being cranky uh, is very W.C. Field. So it, it's just interesting that the influences are there, and I had them on my mind when I was directing the show, but Larry didn't. So, so you know, it's kind of a mixed response. I, 
uh, I, I don't know that anybody looks at the Marx Brothers or looks at W.C. Fields or Laurel and Hardy and says, I want to do what, what they did. But there is a progression. Someone, I think, in the New York Times a few years ago did this kind of like family tree of comedy and started, you know, I guess like in vaudeville and then showed how this person's style sort of rubbed off on this person and then these people followed them and then and it just sort of branched out to people working today and it was actually pretty well thought out and you could sort of see the influences from say the, the 1920s to the well this was done probably 15 years ago you know to the 2000s and see the influences and they are there you know Mort Saul now I did a documentary on Mort Saul and most people these days don't know who Mort Saul was Hugely influential. I mean, Mort Saul was the guy, you know, before Mort Saul, stand-up comedy was really those dopey jokes about, uh, oh, my mother-in-law is so fat that when she sits around the house, she sits around the house, you know, that kind of easy stuff. And then Mort came along and was doing political humor, mm -hmm. very biting political humor. This was in the 50s. And, um, and didn't wear, you know, most comedians wore tuxedos and they were very polished. And Mort came out looking like a college student of the day had a you know, v-neck sweater and an open collar and had a newspaper under his arm would refer to the day's newspaper and do comedy bits about things that happened that day. That's how fast he was and how sharp he was. Well, that totally changed stand-up comedy. And then under him came Lenny Bruce, and then you had like the Second City people with Nichols and May and Bob Newhart and Shelley Berman, and then that gave birth to, you know, Robert Klein and, and uh, um, David Steinberg, and then Richard Pryor and George Carlin. So, you, you know, you, as I say, you see sort of the tentacles. You see how it spreads. Mm -hmm. How one person can, it's like what Charlie Parker did in jazz. You know, one person can change everybody who comes after them. You know, if they're not influenced directly by him, they'll be influenced by somebody who was influenced by him. You know, so. I thought you didn't like the academic question. Well, I, 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 didn't say, I, I didn't say I couldn't answer it. I just, you know. I, I'm going to uh, cross all the uh, 20 other philosophical questions I had. I'm going okay. to go to a one personal question. Not, not private, but on your personality. Because you, you come across as a non nonsense, uh, very circumspect person. And the humor you're attracted to is... I don't, I'm not, I don't want to drink till you finish. I don't want to do a spit take. <laughs> I'm, I'm hesitant to... The humor you are attracted to is very subversive, very sometimes nonsensical. And um, I don't know if there is a way you can account for that divide. No. Okay, I mean, next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what appeals to you appeals to you. And to me, there's no gauging it. I mean... Uh, I, I, I do like kind of a more sophisticated humor, I guess. Um, the, even the Marx Brothers with all their sort of slapstick, I consider some sophisticated humorous. Um, uh, you know, I, I do like a, a subversive element as well. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, I like silly stuff too, stuff that's just silly. Um, but you never know. Something comes along and it strikes your funny bone and, and you, you respond to it. Um, and, you know, with Woody Allen, I take the money and run. His first movie came out when I was nine years old and it was just so funny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, before he started, he kind of matured. He, he was doing these just very silly comedies that. That, re that were very reminiscent, by the way, of the kinds of like Marx Brothers movies. Yeah. And he was, in the Marx Brothers were a huge influence on him. So I was nine years old and Take the Money Run came out. I thought, wow, this guy's great. Uh, and then Bananas was a silly movie. I loved that. And then Sleeper, these were all his early silly comedies. And then Love and Death, which was brilliant. And then came Annie Hall, which was a real turning point because it wasn't a cartoonish comedy. It was a real comedy about two people. It was a relationship comedy. There was heart, there were emotions in it. Um, and... That just not only blew my mind, but blew everybody's mind. And won that year. By the way, the same year Star Wars and Close Encounters came out. It won for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Writer, um, Best Actress. Did I say Best Picture? It won for Best Picture. Um, and so, you know, I kind of feel like I grew up on his films as his films were growing up. Um, but yeah, he was influenced by all the same people that, that I loved. And since some students are going to be watching this, I wanted to ask you, uh, what talents can you tell the students would be required 
for somebody, let's say from uh, television and film, who wants to follow screenwriting, producing, directing? Well, you know, it's all changed now. I, I you know, I mean, I've got my own story, which is uh, just my story. It's not anything that I can advise somebody else. Like I said, I wanted to make this documentary, so I kind of figured out how to do it and how to apply for money. And I made it. And it's like I was talking to, to somebody the other day, a, a very funny comedian. Her name is Erica Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S. If you go on YouTube, you can see stuff of hers. There's actually a routine of hers called uh, Late, Lady Years Old, L-A-D-Y, Lady Years Old, which is really, really funny. And she and I know each other a, a little bit. We had lunch the other day. And um, she hasn't broken yet as big as, I, I think she will eventually, because she's just a very, very solid comedian. But when I was, and I was managing uh, comedians for a while with this company I was working for, Rollins and Joffe. And back then there was a very set way to do it, is that you would go up at the improv or the comedy store or whatever, and you try to get five solid minutes. You get five solid minutes, because back, we're talking way back like in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, the goal was to get on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, or the Carson Show, as we call it. And if you went on the car, if, if somebody from the Carson Show came in, if the talent poker came in and saw you doing five solid minutes in the improv or the comedy store, then the hope was that you could get booked and get on the Carson Show. Um, if you did and you did well, you had a career, and you could play anywhere, and you could play bigger venues, and you were a known entity. And then if you came back, you know, this is what happened to Seinfeld, this is what happened to Richard Lewis. You know, any number of comedians back then. I can name them one after another. And so if you had an agent or a manager, they would work with you to try to do that. And then maybe you'd get a sitcom. Or maybe you, you'd play, you know, in Vegas and pick up a hundred grand over a weekend or whatever. And maybe do movies and all that. So there was, and I was having lunch with Erica the other day. And I said, I have no idea how it's done now. She said, oh, it's all TikTok. You know, so, so how the industry works, and I'm talking specifically here with performance, has nothing to do with how you would break in when I was coming up. And consequently, you know, one thing I'll say is, you know, when I wanted to do the Marx Brothers film, it, it, it took a lot of money to do it because it was all 16 millimeter. And film was expensive, and getting the film processed was expensive. And the equipment that you had to rent was expensive, and the people to run the equipment, you know, were expensive. And then, you, 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 you know, I got in just as it was going from film to videotape. So you transferring the film to tape was expensive, and the raw stock of the tape was it was expensive. Somebody had to underwrite it. Well, now you can have a you can have an iPhone and you can make a movie. You know what people don't know is that you need a, a way to record sound, not just through your phone, because then your sound. Sounds shitty, but um, you know, and, and you get a couple of friends to do it, and you can and you can shoot it, and you can cut it on your laptop for virtually no money. Um, and then what do you do? I don't know. I guess you you put it online or you put it on YouTube, and maybe somebody sees it. How do you get eyeballs on it? I I don't know, but I just imagine that the way you break in now is different than when I was. Now for TV writing. Again, I don't know how this is how it's still done. Maybe it is, is that you would write it what is called a spec script. Just let's say you have a favorite show. Um, I know they're off the air now, but what was it? Big Bang Theory is a big show. So you, you watch that show and you kind of get to know it. You know the characters and the dialogue and you think, you know, I, I have an idea for a story for that show. I could write a script. So you, you write a script. Uh, and then you, or maybe you write a few scripts and then you take those around and try to get an agent. And then if you get an agent, the agent will take your sample work and try to get you on a show as a staff writer, sort of an underling, and you work your way up. If you keep working your way up and you do well, then you know your credit becomes better and your pay becomes better, and then maybe you create your own show. There was a there was kind of a a path to that. Mm -hmm. Now that may be totally different too now. I mean, with everything being streamed, it's not the days of the network. So I'm I'm an old guy and I don't uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how anything's done there. <laughs> so sorry for those of you watching. And sorry to you in the room. I don't know anything. We Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night
Uh, talking about the Caribbean enthusiasm music, uh, is the 11th season coming up? 12. Where have you been? <laughs> so the 10th. No, last oh, season was 11th. I'm missing the 11th one. Yeah. Uh, the 12th is coming? Season 10, season 10 I did not direct one, so you probably didn't watch. No, I, I only watch one through five. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are my big views. <laughs> uh, yeah, season 12 is coming up. In fact, I think they, they, they're, they start shooting maybe this week or next week. I'm going to go back. Now, the first five years I directed most of them, or I would direct like five or six out of the ten. And then I left after season five as a full-time gig to do other stuff. And now I just come back, I direct one episode every season. So I'll, I'm going back to direct my episode in February mm -hmm. for the new season. I know at the very beginning you didn't expect it to be successful. Well, right? we didn't. We didn't even expect a show. I mean, series. that when Larry David called me in October of '98, it was just to do a one-hour special. That was all we were doing. The series was an afterthought because we handed in the special, and then HBO called and said, "How would you guys like to do a series like this?" And when do like, you okay. think it? it uh, but came but to but, but yes, you're right. When we did start the series, we yeah. We thought, you know, we, we, we contracted for 10 shows. We thought we'd deliver five. And they'd say, you know what, guys, eh, nice idea, but we'll, we'll pay you off. You don't have to do the other five. So the fact that it, you know, was this kind of slow growth. It was kind of a word of mouth show. The mm -hmm. fact that it built into this. It was always a cult show. It never got, it was never a huge rating show. Like, you know, Sex and the City was a big rating show. Or the Sopranos, any number of those kinds of shows. Uh, we were always just, we always had kind of, uh, I used to joke we had a, a small but disloyal following. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it, it just built into this kind of phenomenon that none of us expected. And it created the taste by which it was seen. I guess so. Yeah. You know, people talk about the influence of Curb, how, um, you know, a lot of shows started to try to do that look, you know, sort of the handheld documentary look, you know, Modern Family, you know, did that, The Office did that, although the original British Office from Ricky Gervais, I think, was happening at the same time we were doing Curb, uh, and then The American Office was based on that, so I'm not suggesting we were in, oh, but even, um, uh, oh, what was the show, um, oh, come on, with, um, with the guy, you know, who was in the movie, <laughs> that was based on the thing about the guy. Um, no, what was the show that was on with, uh, uh, oh God, we'll edit excuse it. me, I'll be back in 10 minutes, <laughs> give me, we'll edit it. I can't believe I'm blanking out on the name, it was so popular, it was only on for like a few years and then Netflix brought it back, it was an ABC show and then Netflix brought it back, Jason Bateman was in, Arrested Development, thank you very much, you win the, uh, nothing. Um, <laughs> Arrested Development, I mean, I, the two guys who directed the pilot are now, you know, the Russo brothers. They direct these huge Marvel films and everything else. They're multi, multi-millionaires. Well, the first year that they went on, I was nominated for a directing Emmy, and they were nominated for the Arrested Development pilot. And they came up to me and they said, we just basically copied you. I don't say this as any kind of put down. They're very sweet to even acknowledge our influence. But they said, you know, we just said, let's shoot this like Curb. And we watched Curb. And we're trying to make it look like Curb, and they're multimillionaires, and here I am with the free food. So. <laughs> <laughs> what Tell me if I'm wrong. In Curb, there is no breaking of the, of the fourth wall, is there? No, there, there, there was there. Yes, that's right. But there was during the special. The special was shot as a literal documentary. That you know, a documentary is being made that's following Larry David. You hear my voice off camera asking him questions. There were sit-down interviews to camera, that kind of thing. Um, every now and then, a boom a microphone would lower into the shot, and that was fine. You know, Larry might comment about it. Uh, and then when we did the series, you know, I was going to say we, we had a meeting. We didn't have a meeting. It was probably a five-second conversation. Like, I don't know. Should we keep the documentary element in it? Nah. Th those were the kinds of meetings we had on Curb. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we dropped that conceit, but we still had the handheld cameras and, you know, that sort of documentary feel to it, but we weren't presenting it as an actual documentary and nobody was talking to camera, that kind of thing. Okay, I don't know if somebody wants to approach the mic and ask 
another question. Yeah, approach the mic so we can hear you. It's <laughs> such a large, cavernous <laughs> it's, auditorium. It's for the uh, camera. For the camera. I didn't want to approach the He mic. wants you to talk into the mic. I don't care what you do. <laughs> I mean that in a nice way. <laughs> I actually have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to try to ask oh, a couple with one. If, if you could comment you, you want on to sit those. Here. Why don't you sit here? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the resemblance between Mark Twain and Kurt Vonnegut, I wonder if you could comment on that, but that's, that's secondary. I wondered how, it's not until late in your film that his daughter refers to him as dad. Uh, and I wondered how you could, if you could comment on that. Uh, My she, comment on that is I didn't realize it until you said it. She called him Kurt. I mean, it was just, it was almost like jarring. They both called him Kurt, uh, and it was jarring in the in the beginning. But I guess my real question is: you you were you idolizing idolizing is a little strong. You looked up to him and you worked with him for a long period of time. You saw his marriage disintegrate and his family just fall apart. I wonder if you could comment on the impact of that on you. Well, now, I, that first marriage uh, falling apart happened long before I met him. The, the, the second marriage I witnessed being problematic. Um, but uh, the, I'll, I'll, I won't answer your question directly, maybe, but it's kind of interesting. Is, um, so, yeah, his, so, I mean, there, he and Jane were childhood sweethearts. Um, you know, and when Kurt went off to, to, uh, to serve in the Second World War, he basically said, I'm going to come back and we're going to get married. And she said, well, we'll see. And then he came back and really, really pursued her. I mean, almost like stalking. I mean, his, his daughter, Edie, published a book last year of, of his love letters because his mother kept them all. And he was writing like every day. <laughs> And you read them, and it's very, very sweet. He's very passionate, but there's a certain point where it's like, okay, back off, back off. Mm -hmm. So that's how Hardy pursued her. She married him. They had their kids, and then took in the sister's kids, and you see it all in the film. And he's struggling, struggling, struggling. Uh, becomes an overnight sensation with Slaughterhouse-Five, and then leaves his wife. It's the old story, right? So yeah, it, it was hard on the family, it was hard on everyone. It was as um, cordial as those things can ever be. In other words, it never got really ugly and terrible fighting. And it was just like, all right, well, we'll work this out. Um, but certainly it affected the family. And he had met this younger woman, this photographer, and uh, they got involved. So, so uh, but here's, here's what's interesting. I had an early cut of the film in which I, I talk about, uh, we talk about him leaving his first wife for this other woman. And not to make it that cut and dry and simple, it's more, these things are always more complicated than that, but that is the essence of what happened. And, um, and then he goes off and then we, we continue to follow him. And I had an early screening of this film just for you know, a handful of friends. A little more than what's here. And um, and they all wanted to know, well, what happened to Jane? Because they split up and he goes off with a woman and then we sort of continue to follow him in his career. But people want to know, what happened to Jane? And was she upset? What happened to the family? And and it, it was such a, a, a kind of strong um, uh, feeling in the room of people. And I'm, you know, in the editing room working in a vacuum. So I'm know, guessing how people will react to this or that, but it just never occurred to me that that would be really important to people. Now, fortunately, I had interviews, you know, because you interview any one person for maybe you get two, two and a half hours of film, and then, you know, seven minutes of that winds up in the film, so there's all this footage that you haven't used. Fortunately, all the interviews with all the kids talked about the impact that it had on the family and, and what happened to Jane and how she remarried and they remained friends and she still read his books and, you know, they both attended family things and all that. And it wasn't, she wasn't that crushed. She recovered very nicely, married this lovely guy. So I knew I had that footage. 
So as soon as they said what happened to Jane, I said, okay, I can, I can, I can do this. I can take care of it. And then it was a couple more days in the editing room answering that question. And you see it in the film now. They're talking about sort of the aftermath of the fallout and, and what happened to Jane. So I was able to do it. But it was just interesting that it hadn't occurred to me that that would be such an important question that people would have. And, um, you know, by the time I came into the picture, I mean, I think there's, well, their split was in like 1970. I was 11 years old. So, um, and Jane, you know, I, as you learn in the film, I approached Kurt about the film in 82. I didn't start filming till 88 and Jane died in 84. So if I'd gotten some financing and gotten a crew together right away, I probably could have filmed Jane, but didn't know she was ill and, and, uh, you know, would have been a little bit weird to say, you know, let's film Jane right away because she's sick. So I never filmed her, but, uh, through reading a lot of her correspondence and just becoming so friendly with the kids, I, I got to feel I knew her and she was a terrific, terrific woman. I love the story about how she'd go to bookstores and anonymously order Kurt's books <laughs> just to get the sales up. You know, that's the kind of wife she was. And yeah, I think, I think the name thing is, I think just, uh, I guess just an interview, like they would say, yeah, well, Kurt, Kurt, Kurt and Jane met when they're, I guess just calling them by name and then at some point dad. Yeah, I, think, I don't think there's anything behind that, just sort of the convenient way to answer a question. And, and um, I don't think Kurt could help looking like Twain. I, I don't think he like grew the mustache or grew his hair out to look like Twain. But once he did, yeah, he really did look like Twain. He could have done a Mark Twain one-man show. But he loved Twain. He admired him, as we see in the film. His son Mark, his firstborn, was named after Mark Twain. And Kurt did sort of carry on the Twain tradition. He was sort of a modern Mark Twain. Down to the point where Twain, late career, uh, as his writing was winding down, was became a very public speaker all over the country, maybe all over the world. I don't know enough about Twain, but did a, you know, did a lot of public speaking, as, as Kurt did. Do you think that that's a coincidence? Yeah, yeah. I think Kurt was just at a point, you know, Kurt, Kurt never enjoyed writing. And Kurt said, I've never met a good writer who enjoyed writing. He says, whenever I met a writer who said they enjoyed writing, they were usually a lousy writer. <laughs> And then his agent said, "Well, Kurt, listen, I never met a, a you know, a, 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 I never met, I met, I never met a blacksmith who was in love with his anvil. You don't have to love it; just do it. You know, <laughs> Got to make a living." So I think, I think he liked, like I say, just when a fan would write a letter or he'd be on the street, he liked connecting with his readers, with his public. So when he'd speak at a college or something and fill up these huge rooms, I think he liked the laughter. He, you know, he was a humorist. I used to re refer to his bit as, as his, uh, his vaudeville show because he was always very funny. You see that in the film. And I think he liked feeding off the laughter of his audiences. It was something he enjoyed and it was something he could do to avoid writing. Oh, I'm, I, got this, this, I mean, he, he had to write out the speeches. The, those weren't effortless. But I, I think he liked being out among his, his fans. Should wear a fake mustache now. <laughs> <laughs> and curl my hair out. Else, yeah. <laughs> um, could you comment again on, not why it took you so long, but what kind of pushed you over the finish line to actually get this done? I know you talk about it in the film and a large part of it is, but if you could comment again, I'd appreciate it. Um, the other one was, at some point you mentioned when you went to go visit him, I wasn't sure for the last time, but you decided, you know what, I'm not going to film this. And I just wondered, in today's environment, especially the background that you come from, you know, when people, you see people holding up cameras at graduations and stuff, instead of just watching it. And I just wondered if you could comment on that a little bit. I don't know if it's a generational thing, um, because I too like to enjoy things and my wife likes to film them. I just yeah. wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, it, it, you didn't really experience it unless you capture it on your phone, I guess. Um, the uh, what was the what was the first one you asked again? Just sum up. About what put you? Oh right. Well, you know, people have come up with all kinds of explanations. Excuse me. 
Another question. Oh my God, it's Kurt. <laughs> um, people have come up with all kinds of psychological explanations as to why it took so long to finish the film. And there may be something to that, certainly as the years went by. But the, the practical answer was it was never financed. No, nobody ever came along and gave me the money. And I, I, was, I tried to get by. I went to the National Endowment for the Humanities. And you know, I, I went to PBS. American Masters wanted it. In fact, it was American Masters that gave me the money to film that first trip to Buffalo, New York on the train and all that. But they, they didn't have any money to actually finish it. So I couldn't get the money. So it became kind of a hobby project out of my own pocket. Uh, and, you know, if I, if I had the money, it meant I was working. But if I was working, I didn't have time for the film. If I had time for the film, it meant I wasn't working. So if I wasn't working, it meant I didn't have a lot of discretionary funds. So it was just kind of done piecemeal on and off for years and years. And then he died, of course. And now, oh, God, now what do I do? How do I finish this? Do I finish it? Um, and then really what happened was Kickstarter came along and became a viable way to get financing for films like this. Now, so we did a Kickstarter campaign. That was the time that I brought the other director, you see my name and another name, Don Argett, because by that time I was convinced by others and finally caved into the idea that I needed to be in the film myself because there were just too many unanswered questions. If I tried to make it a straight sort of biographical American Masters on Kurt, it would be a dishonest film because our lives had become so entangled now to not mention to not show the man behind the curtain, you know, would have been dishonest. So once I was convinced that I needed to bring this meta element into it, I thought, well, I'll bring another director into it because I don't want to film myself. I don't want to, you know, follow myself around with a camera or interview myself. It made no sense. So I'll bring in another director to sort of do the meta film about me making the film while I concentrate on Vonnegut's biography. So that's what we did. Don Argett is his name. He's a wonderful director. And we created a sort of hybrid between our two strengths because he does a lot of verite films and I do these kind of <coughs> biographical profiles. So then we decided let's do a Kickstarter campaign and, and, and see how it goes. And we did very well. We raised a lot of money. Not enough to finish the film, but enough to at least go back in the editing room and get a cut made and do more filming that we wanted to do. So that was like, even that was like 2014, 15. Uh, but we started to do a lot of filming and, and, and started to edit full time. And that's what really sort of pushed us ahead. And then it's still, then, you know, Don went back to other stuff. Don makes more films in a year than I see in a year. He's one of those guys who just really cranks them out. Um, and, and they're always good. But he had to go work on something else. So then... Uh, and he he was in Philadelphia. So then we had all the all the um, uh, media shipped out to L.A. because I wanted to be in the room editing with an editor. And then it went on for another couple of years. It just never seemed to wind down. And then finally, you know, there's a there's an expression. I don't know who coined it, but a lot of people have used it. Where they say films are never finished; they're only abandoned. Which is true because no one has ever finished a film and said, that's done. They're always thinking about, oh, if I only had a little more time. My, my, I used to say that, um, you know, uh, towards the end, you know, once I had the deadline, to, because this was released in theaters, IFC Films, that I had this deadline to deliver it. So there was sort of this crunch at the last minute. And I said, you know, it took me 40 years to make this film, but if I only had two more weeks, it would have been perfect. You know, I could have done everything I wanted to do. Um, so anyway, that's sort of the, the story that we don't quite get in the film, which is, and at one time I sort of dealt with that in the film as why it was taking so long that I thought, you know, it's already, we're going up, we're getting up to two hours, let's get rid of that. But anyway, now you've heard it. There is a, a probably, I'm sure you know this quote by uh, W.C. Field. He says, uh, the, his epitaph says, I'd rather be living in Philadelphia. Something like it's that. not true, but yeah, that's, oh, the, it's not that's true? the myth. Yeah. <laughs> yes, in our W.C. Fields film, we blow up all of those myths. Uh, yeah, the joke at W.C. Fields, who was born in Philadelphia, became this big Hollywood star, of course, and, and the, the, the rumor is that the, the, on his gravestone, it says, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. 
And, and where that came from was there was an article in Vanity Fair, which has been around for many, many years, where they asked different celebrities of different stripes, you know, what would be your epitaph? Mm -hmm. And that was his. And they printed it in the magazine. And then some people took it literally and thought that that's what it says on mm -hmm. his tombstone. He's actually in a crypt and it just says in W.C. Fields, you know, 18... 95 to no 1945. No, no, no. But um, but I mentioned that because another uh, running theme in this documentary is you know you have the love, you have the friendship, you have the story of Barnegat, but death is a main theme, and that in fact you finish with putting the the date of his uh, mm, of his death. Yeah. That's kind of like the last yeah. image I remember. So that was my way of saying goodbye, finally, acknowledging. Yeah. Because I, it's true, what I say in the film is true, is that I've, that dictionary is still above my desk. And um, I can get emotional talking about this, is I, I would <laughs> literally pull the dictionary out, this is when he was alive, and look at that passage where it says 1922 to blank. And I was so thankful for the blank. I mean, I say this in the film, you've heard it. I was so thankful for that blank, that he was still here that he was alive during my lifetime and I got to know him and I got to be friends with him. It was very meaningful to me. And then when he died, you know, uh, the blank was now filled in, although not literally. So I thought by finally filling in that date, that was my way of yeah. sending him off, you know, acknowledging that he's gone. And we got this idea. I mean, I was going to do it. And, um, and Don was filming with me in LA and I said, you know, I got this idea of something I'd like to do. It might be interesting to film it might be a little too corny or a little too, but let's do it and see if we like it. And I, I, I had mixed feelings about it when I saw it. I thought it, it seemed staged. It wasn't staged, but it seemed staged. And then I thought, oh, what the hell, let's go with the emotion of it. Cause it I think it works, it works perfectly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, the guy with the mustache. Yeah, but death, death, <laughs> death, death, death is a recurring theme. I mean, look, he, 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 Think about what he witnessed in Dresden. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the numbers vary, but somewhere between like you know seventy five and one hundred and forty thousand people were killed. And you know, what were you all doing when you were twenty one years old? When I was twenty years old, I was hanging out with my friends and getting into minor trouble and going to movies and driving around and having fun and going to parties. And he was twenty one years old. He was you know pulling dead bodies out of you know cellars and. Stacking them on top of each other and yeah. lighting them on fire, you know. Uh, so that <laughs> stays with you, you know. Uh, so death was something you thought a lot about and, and finally came up with So It Goes because it's so, it's so prevalent, it's so mm -hmm. everywhere mm -hmm. that what can you do? Mourn every single body that you pull in. So you get to the point where oh, another death, so it goes. Okay, that's life. You know? mm -hmm. um, it's funny that his two famous sentences are "so it goes" and "isn't this nice." Yeah, uh, one for yeah. Death, well, that was life. that's interesting. You should point that. Out. I mean, that was the duality <laughs> yeah. of his life. He he had a great capacity for joy and for appreciating small moments and the beauty of life, and um, an acknowledgement that it's you know when it's over. Uh, you know, when he took that fall. By the way, it was another month before he was gone because he was on, you know, whatever respirators or whatever they hook you up to in a hospital. But he was he was gone. I mean, his brain was, you know, sort of I don't know if it was flatlined, but in any event, there was a debate within the family about whether to shut it all down. And you know, his daughters talked to me about it because I was like family. His daughters remained like sisters to me. And I said, we all know what he would want. Mm -hmm. you know, so it goes. Let yeah. him go. There's no point. And he, he was really, he was truly ready to go. I mean, the message he was sending out at the end is, I'm done. You know, I'll stick around as long as I stick around, but I'm done. I've done everything I need to do. I've said everything I need to say. And uh, I'm getting a little tired of all this. Yeah. There's that line about how we live too long. People live too long. Yeah. And I it's true. You know, older people, and it's sad. And like his one friend says in the film, you get to a point where just sitting around waiting to see what specialist you're going to see now. And that does, not everybody's life, but it's a lot of people's lives. And at that point, it's like, why am I still here? And he was, he was at that point. Mm -hmm. not, not depressed exactly, but just 
done. And I saw the uh, the interview with Charlie Rose where he says, "I'm done writing." And yeah, he was seventy something. Yeah, yeah, he went back on that a couple times. Were you about to get up to approach yeah, the mic? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Oh, I want to make sure we hear from. Who is that masked man? Hello. I've been the one coughing this entire time. Um, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to share something. Um. Like you, I was 15, 16. When I first read Vonnegut, I put, I got a copy for, of Slaughterhouse Five from Esco Library. I wish I kept that copy. So mad I returned it like dummy. Yeah, there are more. And, uh, <laughs> there are more copies. You, can still you know, and then I um, listened to an audiobook of Man Without a Country. But the first book I bought of Vonnegut was Breakfast of Champions. I still I have it in my backpack right there, my, oh, my, my first copy. And when I was when I first got into Vonnegut, I wanted to. I was the kid in high school who was always telling their friends like, "Oh, you should read this guy. This, this guy's great." And then my friends would be like, "Oh, well, he's talking about him again," you know, on and on like throughout my whole high school career, you know, and reading it. And when I first found out about this documentary, I was like, "Yes, a new piece, something new about Vonnegut, so I that I could." Uh, ingest and learn about him more right and when i found that i finally felt because no one i talked to in my life really knew about vonnegut like even my teachers they'd be like oh i remember him you know and when i found it that the documentary and i kept like waiting for updates to, to see when it actually came out because i remember when i remember the first time i saw it only the trailer was out mm -hmm. you know and when i saw it and i saw that for the beginning piece this is probably my third time watching the documentary in wow. full you know and I remember when you got to that part and it's like, this is me. Like, I felt like, yes, like we were talking about how Vonnegut speaks to young people. I was like, yes, that is exactly who I am right there, yeah. right there. Right. And I just want to um, express that, that gratitude for, oh, for you making nice. that, for making that. the documentary. That's so nice. I appreciate that. I really do. And, um, it's one of the most gratifying comments that I've heard from people who've sent me emails or, or even letters in the mail or contact me somehow. Either that, um, either they, they haven't read Vonnegut and after seeing the film, they want to start reading him. That's a great thing to hear. Or they've always loved Vonnegut and this film really just kind of was satisfying and gave them what they wanted. Or they read Vonnegut years ago, haven't read him for a while, but saw the film and now they're picking, you know, that's my favorite thing to hear is that the, 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 you know, the film, inspired them to read or if they're already Vonnegut readers just kind of scratch that itch you know so I appreciate so there's still several Vonnegut books you haven't read yet right oh yeah. uh, well yeah, yeah. well l lucky you because you've got a lot of great stuff ahead of you yeah. and he is one of those authors that if you read him and you really respond and you, like I say in the film like you've said yes I found my author you really have to, you're compelled to read everything. Yeah. Yeah. I was reading his book. It was like one of his movies. He talks about some of those books about writing, how to write. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing about Vonnegut that I see, I see both you and Vonnegut is that, for when I feel like this is I've come across a lot, when I find people that really care about something, you see it in their work, and I see it in the documentary, and I see it in Vonnegut's writing, you know? Mm. And that sort of passion of, like, like you said, like, I wanted to see a documentary of the Park so Yeah, I'll have, I'll, have to, I'll have to make it down. You know, I love that attitude. I love that yeah. That's the thing that really is great. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and, you know, passion is what has ignited all my films, but this one took so long. And like I say in the film, when I approached him, I was 23 and he was 60. And I finished the film when I was 60. And the, the difficulty there is just sort of finding a reason to keep going, to finish it. And, and, and you, know, you know, it's like a marriage. There's a passion at the beginning of the marriage. And do you still have that same kind of urgency, you know, 20 years later? Maybe not, but something else takes over. That's, that's more mature, maybe more meaningful and more important. And with the Vonnegut film, the struggle after all those years was to just not give up and to keep at it. So I just have to finish this damn thing. So that's a big relief now that I have. 
Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. I just wanted to say, uh, I'm a filmmaker and I just wanted to say thank you for making this film. It really does feel like a love fest or uh -huh. it's just so personal. I mean, um, my son goes to school here and I was dropping him off this morning and he's reading Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, he, great. he's reading my old Kurt Vonnegut books. Oh, fantastic. So it's one of those where, you know, you open a box and they go, what's this? And you're, oh, some of mommy's old books. And I want to, I think I want to read this. And then of course, you know, as a parent, when your kid is starting to like read oh, the same things yeah. and going through the same trans, you know, like thoughts and ideas and laughing at the same things. So he was in another class and I was texting him. And so he actually came in for like a second to watch in between his classes. Well, by he, the way, just so you know, it's, I'm not saying this is a plug because it's not like I get money, but it's on Hulu. It's on all the, you know, Apple, um, iTunes, uh, Apple TV, Amazon Prime, for like three ninety nine, if he doesn't that, like it, that's I'll, what I'll I was going to say. Is like sitting in here, I was just thinking, how, like as a filmmaker, what was the choice of making it a feature instead of making it like a series? Oh. Could you not find that like distribution, or is it just like you thought? Okay, I'll make it a series. I'm a long form kind of guy, and then we'll just get distribution second. You know, like after we do the theatrical. So that, that's one question that I have. Okay. Well, first of all, I want to say how great that you and your son will be able to talk Vonnegut, have conversations about Vonnegut. You might have to freshen up and reread some stuff. Today. Oh, I, it's, yeah, no. Um, no, I mean, this, because the whole idea of these multi-part things wasn't around when I started this, you know, that's, that's a very recent, I mean, there's always been miniseries, but sort of the documentary miniseries um, a very new uh, thing that's really come out of streaming. So I, I was just sticking with the original plan. And listen, you know, it wasn't easy getting this film. You know, like I say, it was out of my own pocket, and then there was Kickstarter money, and then it was out of my own pocket again. And then finally, IFC Films picked it up for a theatrical. But it was hardly, it wasn't exactly a bidding war for this. I mean, I went out to a lot of people. And people were, you know, they always say, oh, we love the film, we think it's great, but we don't know that we have an audience for this or, or whatever. Um, and so a lot of people turned it down. A lot of festivals turned it down. You know, Sundance, although it wasn't, I, I never submitted it to Sundance as a finished film. It was always like a work in progress. And really, thank God they turned it down because I would have had to rush to finish it for them. But... You know, it was not. Uh, anyway, I, I'm I'm tr I'm trying to address your question. In that, well, I think that's part of it. It's that because I don't know who's here, but for the film, you know, for what we're talking about, I think that distribution piece and the platform that it's gonna like you've made this very personal film and you want to get it, mm -hmm. you want to have it seen. And so when you right. when I sit here and watch it, I mean I'm I'm just overwhelmed. I can't even talk. I'm so well, so emotional nice by, after watching it. Imagine how I feel. And so and and it is such a big part of your life. And I'm glad you put yourself in the film. But it just made like in sitting here, I was like, I want everyone to see this film. Well, that's that's right. what I kept thinking was I want everyone to see this film. Well, if you're on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, tell tell people to watch. And it. then it's I think that's available. what we do. We just tell well, them to watch it. But, but what do you do? What do you do with all this footage now? Is it going to be in a museum somewhere? I, don't know. I mean, uh, what there, happens with all your films? There's the Vonnegut archives? Museum in Indiana, Indiana. They keep asking me about it. There's the Vonnegut Collection at um, the Lilly Library at Indiana University. I'll, I'll deal with that at, at some point because, yeah, there is a lot of valuable archival material. Um, but uh, anyway, the only p point I was making before is not like everybody was scrambling for the film, let alone for a four part film, you know, Netflix, <laughs> Netflix turned it down. Apple TV turned it down. Um, I forget who else we, you know, Showtime, HBO, everybody turned it down. And, um, so they weren't going to say, Hey, we like this, but if you could make it even longer make it four parts, we'll take, you know, so as, as, as I say, that's kind of a, and, and some things, you know, it's like, this isn't a put down of the film, but like, uh, Ethan Hawke did, a. a piece called the, the the last movie star about Paul Newman and last movie stars about Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward 
certainly worthy of a documentary sort of presentation. But I, I watched it, and it was like four or five parts. And at the end of it, I said, okay, well, this is proof that not everything has to be a miniseries. Because I felt that two hours of that was great, and the rest was filler. Just my own stupid personal opinion about that particular production. But, you know... But you're There's also great, great stuff in it. You're but some, some things don't need to be expanded. But you're a historian. I hope you do more things that you really cover, like longer. I hope you go into like not just the feature film form. I hope you you do some series like that. Well, here's the thing. Uh, you know, if these films are going to take forty years to make, I'm sixty three now. I probably only have two or three more left in me. Uh, but thank you. I appreciate the, the the compliment. So, what's the one you have left? <laughs> oh. I don't like to talk about stuff, stuff you haven't. Yeah, in, until they're ready to, to talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to jinx it. And, um, you know, uh, there's a couple of things. I, not to go down this particular <laughs> rabbit hole, but you see the situation with my wife in the film. And she's, uh, and this is a progressive illness. She's severely disabled now. So I really live the life of a caregiver now because I'm, I'm take care of her and that's really my job now and it's it is full time and every now and then i put in some time on this project i'm trying to do but it's it's like a guy working on a stamp collection you know after dinner he's got oh, a half hour free before he has to put the kids to bed or something so it goes in so i put time in it like that so it's very slow moving but um my priority right now is to take care of my wife it's uh, it's exactly 2 p.m. I Let's don't know. blow this pop stand. <laughs> Unless there's any, any anyone else with the thing. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, you, you just came in right now. You can't jump ahead of anyone. Yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> doesn't work that way. No, yeah, yeah. Let let, let this ahead, gentleman speak first. I'm gonna go first. All right, you're on, you're on deck. <laughs> you're on deck. Uh, first of all, thank you, as everyone is so thankful for you making this movie. It's so beautiful, so well made, labor of love, well edited, concise, beautiful. Uh, for me, I'm also like this woman with her son. My father passed the torch of Vonnegut to me. It was Vonnegut, my whole life was my dad's favorite author. And then growing up uh, with comedies like Back to School, like yeah. I was like, oh, who's this, who's this guy in a movie with Rodney Dangerfield? Yeah. So between my dad and Rodney Dangerfield, I was bestowed the gift of Vonnegut. Uh, I also like your influences a lot. I also grew up like with uh, the Marx Brothers in my house, a lot of Abbott and Costello. Uh, I wanted to know what your favorite Vonnegut book is, mm -hmm. what your favorite Marx Brothers movie is, and what your favorite Woody Allen movie is. Oh, God. Just, you know, real uh. quick. No, I'll, I'll give you, well... Because uh, I love all three of those. Yeah, I'll break it down this way. Sure. I mean, Thanks. <laughs> Bre Breakfast of Champions will always have a special place in my heart because it was the first. Um, Cat's Cradle, I think, is a masterpiece. I think there are a lot of masterpieces. Sirens of Titan blows my mind. Oh, geez, Sirens of Titan. I mean, when Kurt and I got friendly, I've said this before, but, you know, we never really talked about his work. I never really grilled him about his work, just hanging out, you know, having a beer or whatever. And um, I kind of wish I had, because I just want to say, where the f did you get the idea for this book? It's just so mind blowing. And um, and our relationship was so light on its feet. There was so much joking and laughter and silliness and like sophomoric humor, <laughs> like frat boy jokes and stuff like that. And and so I got to know him as just kind of this. I jokingly refer to him as this idiot who likes stupid jokes. Like this to him would be a great joke is, uh, what's the white stuff in bird poop? And then you say, I don't know. And then you say, well, that's bird poop too. You know, that to him was a great joke. So that's how stupid we could be together. And then I would pick up Sergeant Tiger or any number of his books and go, wait a minute, hold on. How did that idiot write this book? You know, it was hard to, mm -hmm. and Sergeant of Titan, of course, is great. Um, I do like the earlier ones. Uh, Jailbird, I'd like to read again because it's been a long time. I, so I don't really have a favorite. I have a handful of favorites. Uh, Marx Brothers movie, I kind of defer to Duck Soup. Sure. And by the way, that week that I was in Sagaponic, staying with him in his house, one night we were just hanging out, uh, just two of us, and he said to me, what, what do you think is the best Marx Brothers film? It's the best one? I, well, Probably my favorite would be Duck Soup. And this was in the days of 
video stores. Gets on the phone, calls up a local uh, video rental place in the in the in town. Says, "Do you have the Marx Brothers Duck Soup?" Okay, yeah, hold, uh, pl please hold it. We'll be. He's ever says, "Let's let's go watch Duck Soup." So we picked up Duck Soup on VHS, brought it home, and watched it together, and laughed like a couple of idiots. And that was a moment in my life where I said, "How the hell did this happen? How am I in Kurt Vonnegut's house watching Duck Soup with him, laughing like a couple of idiots?" That would happen every now and then. And then Woody Allen film, uh, well, Annie Hall was a major, major sure. film for me. And then, God, so many of those films in the 80s, Broadway Danny Rose and Crimes and Misdemeanors mm -hmm. and even Zelig and Purple Rose of Cairo. Again, they're just so, so great. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, again, no one but a handful. Yeah, but the influence on you is, is clear in your style, I think. Just you have a great sense of humor come through with that. Even like a documentary like this, that is about the Marx Brothers, just like you can see the yeah. lineage. I guess. Yeah, I, th I think I, uh, as far as my own personality, my own uh, sense of humor, right, my own view of the world is sort of an amalgamation of different influences. Mm -hmm. You know, Lenny Lenny Bruce is in there. Sure. Um, Vonnie, you know, it's it's all there. I'm just I have no original thoughts of my own. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a collection of great thoughts I've picked up from others. Which works. isn't a bad way to live life, actually. Yeah. What, what do you think of the uh, Lenny Bruce depiction in the Ms. Maisel show? Have you seen that? I haven't really mm -hmm. seen it. People ask me that all the time. It's a really interesting yeah, I, 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 I tune in to one episode to see it, and, and like I thought it was okay. I'm yeah. such a stickler for accuracy. I, I don't like how much they've like skewed the chronology. They, mix up, they match up with fiction and non-fiction. Yes, but also it's like they... You know, the show, I think, takes place in the 50s, right? Late 50s? It or really maybe it starts in, like, 59, and then now it's, like, 62, 62. Yeah. No, yeah, because it hit the shot. Right. But when, when they start, like, in 59, like, I yeah. saw the first episode that he was in. Yeah. He's already talking about his his arrest in New York, which didn't happen until 64. Uh, and I'm just too much of an historian. I go, you can't do that. Sure. You know? Uh, yeah. and, and then his wife there was in New York. He says, no, honey was never in New York. She was in L.A. Right. So I... And and his his performance is, is like okay. I don't think it's dead on, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, Len, Dustin Hoffman in the film Lenny doesn't really capture Lenny, but he's a great actor, and he's just so um, engaging and right, right. watchable that uh, that film sort of turned me on to Lenny. Sure. First. All right, let's let's yeah. go to this. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for being here, and thank you for for making the film. Um, I, I'm an instructor of English and also a science fiction fan. And, and so I thought I would kind of preface my question by, by saying I, I've used, uh, you know, Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 and in my classes. I'm, I'm currently using Animal Farm, which I suppose is more fantasy. But um, do you think the, the academy or, you know, uh, educators are a little bit more understanding of science fiction as an actual literary genre? Because I know the genre was kind of, ghettoized. I mean, going back to the 1950s as, you know, as something that is not necessarily educational. And uh, do you think there's a different perspective today? Or I, I don't know. I, I can't speak to that. But as I've demonstrated earlier, I can kind of get around the question with something anecdotal. Um, and only because I'm not plugged into the academic world. And I'm, I'm also not a big sci-fi nut myself. But, you know, Vonnegut's first novel was Player Piano, which was seemed, which was sort of spoken of as a science fiction book. I guess it was. It wasn't like space science fiction, but it was here on Earth, uh, a look at the, what could happen in the future. Um, and so he was, he sort of uh, emerged as a science fiction writer, which he did not like. Not that he had anything against science fiction. He liked science fiction. He was a fan of science fiction. But it wasn't taken seriously. So he was sort of written off. As you say, it was sort of ghettoized. And he said, you know, critics, you know, put science fiction in a drawer that they mistake for a urinal or something like that. I mean, he, so and then the next book was Sirens of Titan, which I think he can't escape calling that science fiction. And again, a great book, but very thoughtful, sort of existential science fiction. And, um, so he, he was all he was always um, dealing with that. So even when he was writing novels that really, in no way, were science fiction, he still sort of carried that uh, 
you know, carried a, a whiff of that about him. And um, I think there was another point I was going to make that I was leading up to, but I've forgotten. So, so, um, but, uh, oh, oh, I was going to tell you an anecdote, which you'll, you'll get, and hopefully some of you will get this too. This really made me laugh. He was, there was a, a series of uh, short films that were made off of some of his short stories that were done as a, a TV series out of Canada, but were shown on Showtime here. So he was coming into Pasadena for this press conference to talk about the show. And he said, hey, I'm going to be in Pasadena. Do you want to get together? And of course. So we were going to have, I don't remember now if it was lunch or dinner, but I decided to get there early and see some of his presentation. It was him and like the producer of the thing and maybe one of the actors or something. And so he was in front of people. And um, people mistake... Uh, the books that he's written all the time. Like people who know Vonnegut think that he wrote this or that. So like my brother thought he wrote um, Clockwork Orange. Um, <laughs> Vonnegut says, I have a podiatrist who insists that I wrote Contiki. And um, in any event, so somebody, so they were taking questions from the audience and somebody raised their question. They said, um, I want to know what you think about um, films being made from your books in, in general, how you feel about that, and specifically uh, how you felt about the adaptation of Catch-22. <laughs> so, so Vonnegut uh, gave him an answer and he said, well, you know, the books continue to exist as books on a shelf. So the, the film doesn't replace the book. So good, bad, or indifferent, people can still read the book. So I'm not that invested in you know, if they make a good film from my book, that's great. But if not, it's not the end of the world. So and then he says, um, oh, and by the way, uh, Catch-22 was written by Ray Bradbury. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I was the only one who laughed. I was the only one who laughed. Went, oh, Ray Bradbury. Oh. Slaughterhouse 5 has a number in the title. So maybe that's right. Catch-22, Slaughterhouse 5, yeah. And, they, and, and, and Cat's Cradle and Catch-22. And Catcher in the Rye all have cat in them. So. Yeah. yeah. But I love that he says my podiatrist insists that I wrote Contiki. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, what? Um, yeah, Galapagos is, is one that I like. Um, Galapagos is a great story. Yeah. Um, but yes. I hope Monica wrote that. I'm going to yes. No, no, he did. He did. He did. <laughs> yes. The one book he didn't write that people think he wrote was uh, Venus on the Half Shell, which was a science fiction parody. It was done as a Kilgore Trout novel. Kilgore yes. Trout, whom you all know mm -hmm. from seeing the film, was a fictitious science fiction writer that Kurt invented for his books and always wrote about the kinds of books he written, which were really cheesy science fiction books. And he was approached by Jose, Philip Jose Farmer, or anyway, Jose Philip or Philip Jose, I can never remember, Farmer, who was actually a very good science fiction writer. I haven't read his, his works, but he said to Kurt, do you mind if I write a Kilgore Trout novel and actually publish it? Out of and Kurt thought that was kind of funny. He said, yeah, sure, go ahead and just told him he could do it. And then the book came out and got quite a following. And then Kurt was kind of annoyed because this guy had made money yeah. off of using Kilgore Trout's name. And um, and what made it worse is that people assumed that Kurt wrote it under the pseudonym of, you know, I love Venus on the half shell. Well, that's great, but I didn't write it. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he actually got quite annoyed when people would bring that up. I remember the, the, the writer, uh, science fiction writer Harlan Ellison used sure. Winter Bird as one of his pseudonyms. Yeah. It's like a thing with science fiction writers that yeah, and they were friends, Vonnegut and Ellison. No, you got to be sick of me by now. We really should wrap this up, right? I feel like I've overstayed at a party. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Bob. It was uh, really a luxury to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it.